Okay, so let's start the show. Hello, strangers and friends. Thank you for coming to improve PowerShell scripting with Azure integration session. My name is Alexander Nikolic. I'm a PowerShell and Azure trainer, one of the co-founders of PowerShellMagazine.com. And uh, I will be your speaker for the next 45 minutes. Uh, to give you a little bit of a background why I created this session. Uh, a year ago, I was working with a client and they want some of my help with the PowerShell scripts that they have. So before accepting a job and everything, I asked them for their environment, how it looks like, how they're running their scripts, how many of those scripts they have and how many admins they have that actually have access to the scripts and, and all of that. Right? And they use a, a, a Jumpbox server with a couple of admins will have access to the machine. They had their own uh, folder structure for a scripts. Some of the scripts that they have there, they use to kind of do the ad hoc execution. Some of them will be executed by the task scheduler. I asked them about how they are dealing with the secrets. They told me because they are uh, aware of the security implications of hard coding plain text passwords in the scripts. They have uh, a separated textual files next to the scripts that they are reading <laughs> in their scripts. And uh, uh, some of them mentioned that they heard that also they can do that encrypted in a file. So, so that's pretty cool, like when you have those people that are dealing with a logging material and then they know that it's bad to put passwords on a post-it and uh, put it on a monitor so they hide it behind the mouse pad. <laughs> so that was kind of a same kind of a security approach. And so like, uh, okay, I, I see that uh, we can do a couple of improvements to your system. So uh, also it was kind of concerning that they have only one Jumbox server, not a cluster that will kind of a, have a supportive case that one of them is kind of a, not in a good shape. Let's put it that way, right? So it's like, okay, let's think about something that can be improvement for your environment, but at the same time, it will not cost you a lot or it can be almost kind of a free for you. So you will just improve things with the modern technologies without investing a lot of money in the whole process, okay? So Microsoft was uh, realized a couple of years ago, I think it was uh, one of the last in-person uh, Ignites in Orlando and uh, they introduced a, a service that could help us with this uh, kind of a struggle to have a control over complex distributed environments. And they wanted to have a consistent management of the things that are on premises and in a cloud and edge, right? They were aware that there is a, the problem of these joint and management tools that are everywhere, already, right? So for all those problems, Microsoft vision was to offer us Azure Arc. And Azure Arc for enabled for servers was the first of the services that came out as a GA a little bit later. And that was, that's the one of the services that I offered to the client as a kind of a solution for the problems that they have. Uh, the Azure Arc for servers will enable them to kind of uh, manage the whole environments they have, right? On-premises stuff and also the cloud stuff, right? Which is, at that time was kind of started being very important for them because they started the cloud journey as well, right? They started moving from just having things on-premises with certain things running in Azure as well, right? So it kind of made sense for them to go that way. So Azure Arc for enabled service works in a way that it projects the existing uh, resources that lives outside of Azure to Azure, right? So the Azure becomes uh, aware 
of the existence, and then that enables us to use the managed tools that exist in Azure against those resources that are non-Azure resources. Consistency is always important to me, and I always like when you, we can do consistently certain things, right, right, so that we have certain rules and establish certain steps and procedures for something in one environment that we can use the same thing in other environment, really. So it's not that we need to change those things every time when we manage different resources, depending if they are living on premises or they are living in Azure, or maybe we have something in some other cloud provider, really, right. So this is a really, I think, even uh, outdated image that Microsoft uh, used for talking about uh, Azure. Uh, they probably updated in, at that link, but I'm using still the old one because I think it's just simple and explains good enough things, right? And I like that it's in a light theme. The new theme for Azure Arc is usually dark and everything is hard to see for me with my eyes in the glasses, I'm not getting younger, so it's kind of easier for me to go with this thing really, right? So what you can see here is that uh, inside of Azure, we have a couple of different tools and experiences from a user perspective that we can use here. We can do things with a portal, we can do things with the command line tools like Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI. And then we have a Azure Resource Manager as, as a heart of everything really, right? So, Inside of the Azure, Azure Resource Manager is the one that will be used by default to manage resources in Azure. But then we have this projection when we enable the Azure Arc Manager to also work with the non-Azure things. And those servers that they have on premises are those resources that we want to kind of put under that umbrella and control of the Azure management. Really, right. During one of the lunches during the conference here, I, someone asked me about this session and I gave them a little bit of a teaser for it. And next to me was another speaker who says like, good luck with all that in the real world because he tried to do the same with his clients and they were very uh, opposite to, to the kind of a managing things on premises from Azure, right? They didn't like that idea at all. Uh, it's a German speaker, and Germany is known as a country that it's not very cloud friendly. Still, they, they like their own premises stuff. They like to kind of have physical access to their servers, to kick them from time to time. And you know, like they just like that physical thing there, it looks like so much compared to some other countries in Europe or in America when people are kind of more open to cloud things. But the, the point here is that uh, compared to how it was uh, at the beginning of Azure when people had some problems to even put anything in, in, in Azure, that's not the case anymore. And uh, uh, from a security perspective, lots of companies realize that they don't have the same resources that can put into security research and security as Microsoft really, right? So if you kind of delegate that part to Microsoft, you kind of are doing the good thing really for yourself really, right? Because you cannot compete with all the security machinery inside of Azure and Microsoft itself. Doesn't matter what kind of organization you really run, especially if it's a financial one. Trust me, Microsoft have more resources for kind of a dealing with the security than you really, right? So things are kind of, in my mind, always more secure if, if I kind of give that to managed services that Microsoft controls, really, right? Because they need to be compliant with so many of those standards that uh, I trust them that way. Oh. And also I like when I can have a kind of a centralized location for managing everything, doesn't matter where it is, really, right? If I need to manage something, do I really need to know if that server lives on premises or in a cloud, right? It's much better if I abstract that completely, right? And just focus on the things that needs to be managed and the things that needs to work to support the workload and the business and all of that, really, right? Who cares about where it is, right? That, that should not be the, the thing, really. So uh, 
to get back to that uh, problem that we had when I wanted to enable its Jumbox server to operate better and those scripts to operate better in a more secure way with a better delegation of access to the things and using some of the modern ways to access them and, and all of them to make them accessible, not just on premises, then maybe from the outside without even assigning the public IP addresses to them. That would be awesome, really, right? Those kind of things. Uh, when I look about all of that, then it's like, okay, uh, the Azure Arc enabled servers really work nicely with a couple of cool management services in Azure. So once when you enable and onboard your on-premises Jumbox server to Arc, you make a nice way to connect it to Azure Automation Service. And Azure Automation Service is uh, the oldest automation service in Azure. It was uh, a serverless before serverless was the word, really. If everyone thinks that everything started with Azure Functions, you're wrong. No. Everything started with Azure Automation. Because Azure Automation used those sandbox machines to run us, to run your workers, as they called them, to run your run books, and you didn't have any control on them. They were all managed by Microsoft. Isn't that definition of a serverless, not taking care of those machines and delegating that to a, a cloud provider? It is, really, right? We just didn't call it that way. It was a really amazing service if you think about it. The only problem with Azure Automation Service, and you might have known that already if you have been to my session last year, when I talk about a revival of Azure Automation, rebirth of Azure Automation, really, almost like a phoenix came out of ashes, really, because we thought for a couple of years that Azure Automation is, if it's not dead, then it's in a deep hibernation, really, right? And even the messaging from Microsoft was use Azure Functions. That's the cool new thing. But you need to understand the, the conceptual difference between those two. Azure Functions are there to support your tasks. They will run fast and be done very quickly. Azure Automation is created with long-running tasks in mind, okay? Very different thing, really, right? To achieve the same thing with Azure, to, uh, with Azure Functions, you will need to work with the durable functions, and good luck with that, really, right? That's not easy concept. It's not easy to use. Okay, and Azure Automation is primarily created at first to support PowerShell. It was almost like a PowerShell as a service kind of thing, really, right? They added later support for Python as well, right? They started with a PowerShell in mind, and that's still string very strong. And you see people that invested back then, they are still using the service. And actually, during that, which is really interesting, is that during that hibernation period, Microsoft looked at telemetry data and all of that, and they realized that the usage actually is increasing and adoption is actually rising, which is just crazy that they didn't do almost any improvements, any modernization, uh, modernization of a service, but people continue to use it because they got some value out of it. And when Microsoft started changing it and making it better, more modern, supporting a couple of very cool things there, uh, I was really happy to see that change. All right. So Azure Automation Service itself changed a lot in the last two years or two and a half years with a couple of new things that came between my last session about them here and this moment, and we will talk about that as well, okay? So the whole point of uh, connecting your on-premises Jumbox servers to Azure is that we will first that do that with the Arc, and that will enable us for a really nice connection between those then Arc machines to Azure Automation when we'll onboard them to be hybrid workers, and then we can pick the execution of our scripts against them instead of Azure, okay? So this is what we get here. Uh, thanks to this connection, we will also get nice access to 
monitoring execution and kind of getting a feel of what's happening with our things because we will get access to nice connection to Azure Monitor. Because it's monitored and connected to the Azure, uh, to the Azure itself, that gives us chance to connect it to a different Azure services. It's all that about that Azure integration part, right? So for example, how you deal today when you need to send email with the results of your script executions to inform your admins about problems with the script or just with the results of your script execution. You need to rely on some uh, command list that will do that and we have some recent changes when one of them is kind of a deprecated so you will need to go with it other ways. But in Azure, if you have all this set up, then you can use Azure Logics. You can create Azure Logics and then you use connectors to Microsoft 365. And if you're a user of Microsoft 365, you can very easily make that work for you. Because just that connection to Azure Management System opens all those services to you so that you can extend things to your liking. You are not just limited to the things that run on premises on you, on your single Jumbox server. You see the difference of things and how you can scale with stuff? And one of the, the best things that you get almost, you get it actually for free, but not just for free, but it's super easy to set it up, is you get high availability. Because hybrid workers working in a way that first you need to create a hybrid worker group, and then you add a couple of your ARC on-premises servers, to the hybrid Rumble worker group, and immediately you get a high ability. You don't need to build a cluster. You don't need to pay for anything to get that functionality. And immediately with two or three machines in the same hybrid Rumble worker group, you are assured that if something bad happens with one of them, the other ones will be actually the runners of your script. And you will not be even aware of the problem as long as one of them is alive and kicking, which is just amazing, really. And it's just like a, kind of one line of code that you need to do to add machine, or even in a portal, it's just like stupidly easy. You just click on add and add one more machine to the group, and you get high ability just like that. No special setups, no worrying about anything, no storage or witness or whatever. I mean, nothing like that. You just get it which is brilliant, really, if you think about it, right? So uh, that's all about slides. Let's go and talk a little bit about how to do stuff. So uh, the first thing that you need to do is you need to onboard your on-premises server to Azure Arc. Because we are dealing here with a small number of servers, two or three of them, the option that says uh, do that kind of a one by one, going to machine and doing it will be sufficient. But there are also a, a better ways to do it in case that you need to onboard a much bigger number of machines. Okay. By the way, uh, Microsoft silently changed the name from uh, Azure Arc enabled servers to Azure Arc machines somehow, uh, and I noticed that uh, happening a couple of months ago, but now it looks like it's almost official because it's everywhere here, but not in the documents, which is kind of always the case, right? Documentation is a little bit behind of those changes. It's just unfortunate they didn't communicate, or at least I'm not aware of the public blog post of anything about that change. So now uh, the Azure Arc machines are under machines here, and you can see here that uh, I have a bunch of them. Some of them are expired, some of them are offline, but I have also two of them that are connected. And to give you a little bit of feedback, what's behind all this, those two machines are actually two VMs. They run uh, in a data center of my best man in Slovenia, under his desktop, and uh, he is an amazingly great guy that kind of offered me uh, space there. So I have a couple of VMs in his environment. 
they're running for those because um, I wanted to kind of, a, for the demo purposes, build the whole environment in Azure, which is also one of the recommended ways to try Azure Arc for servers. But unfortunately, if you pick that way, it doesn't support a hybrid worker extension that we will use. So you cannot use it for this specific scenario. But in general, if you never ever tried Azure Arc enabled servers, tried it in Azure. What you need to do is you need to build the Azure VMs and then you need to kind of uh, uh, change them in a way that Azure doesn't look at them anymore as a Azure VMs, but he will, it will have a feeling that it's dealing with something that lives outside of Azure, right? Because when you build Azure VMs, Azure VMs get a VM agent, and then VM agent is used for communication with Azure, and Azure knows because of that that it's dealing with the Azure VMs, right? But this is what we don't need here. We want actually to kind of a trick Azure to think that it's working with the non-Azure machines, right? And that's very well documented in the Azure Arc for service documentation as a kind of a recommended way for you to try the service without using your own resources, building VMs in your environment, because it's very fast. And there is also Azure Arc Jumpstart project hosted in a GitHub that has a bunch of scripts that will do all that work for you, building much more complex things than just enabling a couple of servers. It's amazing project that it's community driven by led by Microsoft. And it's just amazing for great demos for your clients, for your managers inside of your organization, for you to learn stuff. Just be aware that things that you will build there will cost you money, right? You are building them in Azure, so once when you are done, just clean up the resources. Just be aware of that. The best thing is that everything is automated, mostly with PowerShell and some help of a bicep templates. So once when you are done with the testing, there is no problem for you when you clean all those resources to rebuild that very quickly the next day and continue working on it because you don't want to pay for those resources overnight, okay? So that automated thing is very great. Azure Arc jump starts. Okay, but those two machines are not like that. Those two machines are real VMs running there just because that scenario doesn't support Hyper-V Rumble, right? I've heard that uh, from a team and they told me that they will never support that. So I just need to kind of build it differently. I cannot use that for it, okay? So the thing is that once when you are here with Azure Arc machines and you want to create a new one, we will go with the add machine and you have a couple of helpers here from Microsoft adding a single server or a multiple servers or using the update management. Uh, forget for now for this third one because Microsoft is actually transitioning from update management solution that it's part of Azure Automation to update manager service, okay? So for now, kind of forget about this one. Focus on the first two. If you need to onboard a couple of machines, adding a single server approach is very nice. If you need a bunch of them, then multiple servers is much better when you will first create a service uh, principle, and this is what you will use because you don't want to be the guy who needs to pass the credentials for every single server if you are onboarding 20 servers, right? No one likes to do that kind of thing, right? If you are onboarding uh, services, uh, servers that are part of your on-premises domain, which was the case for that client, onboarding is even easier because Azure PowerShell team built AZ connected machine module that works over PowerShell remoting to enable your machines and onboard them to Arc, which is probably the easiest way if you ask me. And I'm a big fan of remoting, so that's kind of things like why I like that approach, but it's connected to machines being in domain, right? Those two machines were not built in domain, in domain. they are just in a work group, so I needed to pick a different approach, and the approach that I picked is this one, 
I clicked on the generate script and Microsoft generated script for me, okay? For all that to work, you need to uh, give them information about the resource group that you will use for storing the resource that will be created for your Arc enabled machine, okay? When the process is done, your Azure Arc enabled machine will get its own unique ID in Azure, okay? It will become the resource. It will not be the resource called virtual machine. It will be a resource called hybrid uh, machine that represents the Arc machines, right? But that enables Azure to become aware of it, okay? So now we need to, as any resource that we need to put in a resource group, this is the same thing for the Azure Arc machines, right? So you pick one or you create a new one and you uh, pick a region as well. In this case, uh, I pick West Europe. The operating system is Windows. You can use this with both Windows and Linux, but those machines were Windows and I'm using Windows here as well. And then for a connectivity method, you can use the public endpoint that I will use for uh, this demo purposes to create a, a script, but you can also go through the proxy server or the best possible way with a private endpoint, okay? So if you are concerned about that, the security and things, private endpoint is a solution for it and this service supports it, okay? Then uh, you click on download and run and you get the script that you need to execute on your machine that you want to onboard to Arc, okay? The main thing that will actually happen when it downloads the install Windows AZ CM agent uh, PS1 script, this is where all the logic lies for the onboarding things and, and doing stuff. Just be aware of one thing that it's kind of a not uh, advertised so, uh, by Microsoft, but I think it's good to know that in this line here, Microsoft is sending logs of your installation process to Microsoft, right? If you are not happy about that, then just remove these lines, okay? Just be aware of that. Microsoft is doing that for one purpose, because they want to help you. In case that you have a problem and something fails, they will get a correlation ID, and when you call the support, they, they can actually help you, right? But if you are concerned about this thing, then just remove it. Don't blindly just execute anything downloaded from internet, even if it's created by Microsoft, right? So just kind of be aware of that. So you can download it, or you can just copy paste it to a clipboard. You will log in then to a machine that you want to onboard and run the things there. The, what will happen in, in, in the meantime is that uh, you will download the agent from the Microsoft Download uh, Center, then you will install that uh, agent on a, on a server and create the resource in Azure for a, a server and associate it with the agent. The heart of, of everything with the Arc is that uh, connected machine agent, really. That's the, the kind of a center of the system. This is, this is how it works, really. Right? This is the one that needs to work correctly. This is the one that will send the heartbeats to the ARC service so that ARC service is aware that is it connected or is it offline and how uh, that works and support some additional services. So that agent is crucial for all these things to work. All those services that are coming when you are onboarding machine are visible when you go to the services applet in a, in a server and you will see a bunch of new things there that will that will happen supporting the agent and some additional services, okay? So, uh, here I have a script that I just copied from then and then I execute it on, a, on a my machine and this is the output that you will, you will get. When you are doing it for a single machine, just be aware that you need to be present because you will need it to interactively pass on your credentials. If you are not happy with that, if you're working with the more machines and you want to fully automate, then you need to pick the second option to go with the service principle. Then the service principle will have a proper permission and being there the one that will actually execute things and, and connect everything there 
without any interactive prompting and passing the credentials, okay? So just be aware that those are kind of two main things. The one is just like avoiding in credentials in a browser, really. That's, that's, that's the thing, really. So once when everything is done, you will get that uh, ID there and your machine will be visible in the portal in Azure Arc here. So when you come here, it will show up here as connected one, okay? When the machine is connected, when you click on it, you will get a couple of more additional information that is quite useful about the version of the agent because you will realize once when you start using this that from time to time the agent needs to be updated, right? Because Microsoft will, is constantly developing new features and supporting new services and things, so the agent needs to be updated from time to time. Don't be surprised that if you onboard the machine and then shut it down because it's testing purposes, you forget about it, and then six months later, you connect it again, and it says like, okay, now we have a problem. Machine is not connected immediately because there is a couple of new versions of agent. In the meantime, you need to first fix that and update them, and then uh, you will get them later. Right. There are different processes for updating that, but I will not go that deep, but just be aware of that that agent needs a little bit of a care so that everything will function properly. So you will get a couple of basic uh, informations here, but that will allow you already to connect this to those management services in Azure, which is just great stuff. What we will focus here for the, at the beginning is how to connect this to Azure Automation accounts so that we can run our scripts from Azure Automation accounts. Is there anyone here that never tried Azure Automation account? A couple, okay. So the basic idea behind Azure Automation account was to provide a kind of central location when you will put all your scripts, they call them run books, and they did that to uh, make a connection to the product that they both, at the time that kind of a, they needed some kind of an orchestrator but uh, Microsoft didn't have time to create his own, so they bought uh, the one that I forgot the name about, maybe someone knows from Microsoft. Was it Opalis? Yeah, Opalis. Opalis. And they use the term RAM books. So that's why we are not calling scripts scripts, but calling them RAM books in Azure Automation. But practically, uh, at the beginning, it, they were workflows. Okay. Does anyone remember PowerShell workflows? Wasn't it fun to use them? <laughs> because it was that fun, we don't have them anymore. So uh, they still exist, actually. They're supported in Azure Automation Service, but I seriously don't know a single person that still use them. Maybe they have something from those days that still runs. But uh, number one request from everyone at the beginning was, please, 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 Microsoft, support just pure scripts. Don't force us to write workflows. They are hard and we want to reuse what we already have as much as possible, right? So then Microsoft created Azure Automation account, added a little bit later support for scripts. People stopped using workflows at all and they were very happy with the automation account. One of the great benefits of automation account is that they had some co something called shared resources. When you can for example, create encrypted credentials. They are part of a service. So you don't need to store those things in some textual files, encrypted or not. But you will get them encrypted from the database that it's supported by Azure Automation Service, which is just great. And I'm talking about something that was pre-existing the Azure Key Vault, okay? Nothing wrong to kind of use a Key Vault to get, fetch those, but Azure Automation Service has a great support already for encrypted variables, for credentials, for certificates, and every single of your RAM books can use them. This is what they call shared resources. Okay. So every single one of them can actually use them, which is just amazing. With the service itself, a big change happened recently when they moved from run as accounts to manage identities. 
That was a huge change from security perspective, okay? Originally, Azure Automation Service, for people that never tried it, used run as accounts, a regular ones and the classic ones. I forget even what was the reason why we have those two. Uh, I mean, the classic ones, I, I seriously don't remember anymore, to be honest, because I stopped them immediately when they introduced the managed identities. The problem with them is that their certificate will expire. Who likes expired certificates? So with managed identities, we don't have that problem, really, right? So now Azure Automation Account supports both system assigned managed identities and the user assigned managed identities. And that changed the game a lot for dealing with those things because we don't need to worry about it. They are called managed identities for a reason, right? Microsoft is taking care of them. No? We are not dealing with the passwords. We are not dealing with the certificates, right? They are managed by Microsoft, right? Great change, right? If you haven't did that migration, please do. Don't wait till the last moment. I cannot remember the deadline, but do it as soon as possible, really. And there is also a migration guide in the documents for Azure Automation that will tell you how to do that, okay? In the easiest possible way, okay? So that's one of the biggest changes that, that happened that really kind of uh, uh, made everyone happy. Okay, so uh, I will just show you a code, although we will not run it. Uh, if you need to quickly create automation account, it's very easy in a portal as well, but I like to promote a little bit of templates if it's possible for certain things. And this is a, a bicep code, bicep file that will create automation account for you uh, together with a, a, what was the name, workspace? for supporting the uh, uh, logging of, of things with uh, Azure Monitor and log analytics kind of things later. The only thing that is missing here is that uh, you can also get some default or initial RAM books created. So when you do the creation through the portal, then the uh, Azure Automation team will create a couple of tutorial RAM books for you how to log in using managed identities. They did that before for run as accounts, and then they updated those run books to support managed identity, right? I'm not doing this here, but I just wanted to show you that seriously, in like less than 40 lines, you can create an automation account, system managed identity to it, and have it that all in like 15 seconds, really, right? Without any clicking, really, right? So, so just like you change the parameters and you have it, right, right? Or you can have it as a parameter file and just use it, but super easy thing to do. Once when you do it, you will get the modern automation account with all the modern features, right, right? That's also the thing with the automation account. Every time when they do some of those new features kind of things, it's not a bad idea to actually build automation account from a start if it's possible for you, but when, if you automate all that, that it makes really sense, and then kind of a move all the run books to the new thing and kind of do the reconnection of things, because sometimes you will miss a couple of things if you continue reusing the old ones. Kind of a enabling new features in the old ones, but it's better sometimes to start fresh with certain things. And really depends on how you organize your scripts in your organization. Some people like to have everything in one automation account. Some people like to have automation accounts kind of assigned to a different group of developers, scripters. Some people like to organize them by departments. I mean, there are really a number of ways to do that. And some of them can work for you nicely. Some of them will maybe not be for you, right? Just kind of be aware that you have options to do that differently, right? Depending on your needs, okay? So this is just a bicep file to create, let me just check the time, how it works. And then uh, once when you, when, you, when you have that, uh, you need to connect your Arc servers to Azure Automation, okay? You need practically to promote them to hybrid workers. Uh, I will share all this code with you 
later so that you know that you don't need to click and, and things for all those things. I don't need to kind of execute every single one of those things. I just wanted to prove also to myself that everything can be done with Azure PowerShell. All the steps of creating a Roundbook uh, worker group, adding servers to the Roundbook uh, group, all of that can be done with, from a command line. You don't need to go to a portal to do that. But also, it's uh, especially when you learn how to do uh, certain things, it's uh, uh, very good when you kind of have that help of a portal to go very quickly through certain things. So let me just try to find the one that I want to show you. So if you want to do that from a portal, you will go to hybrid worker group, create one, and then you will start. Uh, I'm just hybrid worker group. So it's not in this one. Now I'm confused a little. Wait a minute. Let me check for it. This is strange. Because you have two hybrid worker groups. One is the system one that is supported by that update management uh, system. And here is. Uh, Um, is it is it because of resolution? Really? <laughs> wow! Now oh, those those recording guys they are messing up with me. Yeah, because I, I was really like like am I in the right place? I mean I'm like okay, thank you for your help. So that's the group name, and then you will see that we have to hybrid workers, which means that we immediately have a, a higher availability because I added those two ARC machines here and you can see them here. Maybe you recognize those long names from the list of uh, Azure ARC machines. Those are, those are the two. Uh, when I add them to all that, I also enabled a hybrid worker ex by using extension, which is much easier now than through the agent because enabling extension is also very nicely supported from a portal. When you go to Azure Arc Machines and then you click on extensions there, one of the extensions that is available is hybrid worker extension. And you just click on it and, and pass like a two values, I think, and you are done, really, right? Super easy. So this is also one of the things that change that is just now amazingly good. That super easy installation through extensions instead of through the agents. There's also a way to migrate from agent base to extension base, and that's also documented in Azure Automation. I like to promote documentation. Right? I like how those guys are doing their work. So now that we have those machines uh, connected here, we need to kind of focus on uh, one more thing that is kind of a new, and that's called runtime environments. Runtime environments are new way for you to add Interpreter like a PowerShell or a Python and those PowerShell modules to the system that will be used. Because that was one of the main pain points before, the management of the modules that will be available to you to run them and use them in your Runbox. With the runtime environment, finally, Azure Automation actually fixed the problem and made it much more flexible. So by default, you get six system generated environments. And let's look at this one, PowerShell-7.2. What lies behind is actually uh, access for you for two things, Azure PowerShell and Azure CLI, right? This is new thing. So when you pick 7.2, you get access to Azure CLI as well, which is just amazing. If someone visited my workshop, you know how critical it is to actually be good with both. I know it's a PowerShell conference, but Azure CLI is there to stay. So you get access to a little bit old version of AZ. The PM for Azure PowerShell is here, so he might kind of give a little bit of a notch to Azure Automation guys. 
uh, 8.3 when the current one is 11.5. And like, okay, guys, it's time to update. And then we have 2.56 for Azure CLI when the latest one is 2.59. Uh, uh, okay? The good thing is that you can create your own. So just don't stay with this uh, system ones, create your own. So to create your own, you can add some additional packages there. And you can see here that I added a couple of graph packages, which is just awesome. So when I create my runbook, I can say that use this runtime environment, and it's still not implemented, but it will be. The runtime environments will work for now with the cloud jobs in a way that if I add those additional modules here, when the execution comes, those modules will be added to the sandbox machine, and they will be executed. Unfortunately, right now, this is still not supported on hybrid workers, but it will be. Well, I don't know how soon, but it will be. So once when you connect a hybrid worker, uh, runbook to the runtime environment, and you execute that against a hybrid worker, there will not be a need for you to manually manage modules on your on-premises server. They will get it in the same ways as the sandbox machines from Azure Automation. And that would be a game changer, right? It's still not here. Right now, you need to manually install everything that you want to use, which was the same as before, but the change is coming. You just need to be aware of that, that this is the future. This is how it will work in the future. A question? Uh, any ideas if they're intending to do that with the actual runtime as well? So like, we, we just went through and, and I'm right now in an exchange of emails with them about the whole thing. So we so far focused on modules because I was really unhappy when I realized preparing this talk for you that modules are not coming in the same way as they are coming for a cloud. But I hope that will also happen with the installation of PowerShell 7 or Azure CLI. What is really good now is that if you install newer version of Azure PowerShell, of PowerShell 7, or an Azure CLI, that version will be used. Not the one that is present here in a definition of a runtime environment, which is really good. It's also a sign that it's actually your version that is used, really, right? Just be aware of, because I'm kind of going over time, just be aware of one thing, is that when you do that installation, to be, that, uh, change to be visible in Azure Automation, you need to restart a hybrid worker service, okay? Because the change needs to happen in a path variable, but even if you see it locally in a path variable, you need to restart a service, okay? Don't restart the whole server. Service is enough, okay? Another thing is that they also enable SSH access to ARC on-premises servers without public IP address. For that SSH and also for any, like a classical SSH address when you have access to the public address or thing, for path change to be visible, you need to restart SSHD service. And we did a one hour troubleshooting session just before this one with the open SSH expert here in the room, Danny. So that was quite experience for both of us because I realized that I wanted to kind of show you the SSH access to things and I didn't have access to PowerShell, although I know that PowerShell is there. I didn't have access to Azure CLI, although I know that it's there. When you RDP to machine, it's there, right? But the path would show different things there and it was like, what's happening here? And then we realized that we need to update SSHD service as well so that it becomes aware of the path change, right? So as you can see, the, to improve things and to kind of make all those things connected, there is a little bit of work, right? But once when you are done with all that, you will actually improve your system significantly and open it for new scenarios because you will then just open it for integration for all Azure services. And then your imagination is just the limit of the things that you will do.
You will not be any more limited with just your own premises server and all the things that you have there, okay? I went over time, so, right? It was a 45 minute session, so uh, I went over time and uh, I will be available uh, for all the questions, all the things in a, in a hallway during uh, breakfast or a lunch till the end of a conference. Please reach out and thank you for your time. And I hope that you learned something new and enjoyed the session. Thank you very much. <laughs>